Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Christopher Wasserman, the foundation of the Zermatt Summit and the organizers, thank you so much for bringing us all together and for having this opportunity to reflect on, on some very big questions that in our daily lives perhaps we're not able to spend as much time on. So I want to build on a few things that, that have been discussed over the course of this morning and, and day already about trust, integrity, and courage. And, and I'm going to talk about politics with a small p. Obviously, I'm not a politician. I was introduced. I've spent my whole career working in the NGO sector. And this has been a journey for me of 21 years. But I'm going to talk to you about politics with a small p. Not just because every assertion of power is political, but because I hardly need to convince most people that you know, we don't have a surplus of remarkable, inspiring politicians these days. There's a deficit of them. There are conflicts around the world which seem to be motivated by the basest of inclinations, whether it is what's happening in the seas between China and, and all of its shoreline neighbors over resources that may or may not exist in the seas, whether it is between Ukraine and Russia, Israel-Palestine, but also internal major issues, the rise of the far right in these recent European elections, the inexorable uh, inequality, it seems, in the US and elsewhere, and, and what some Chinese have described in China basically as a 1% democracy. And say, if this is what you have, we would rather have something else. And, and so there's a deficit of, of quality political leaders. And, and I would like to reflect on the fact that partly this is a reflection actually of a deficit of citizen demand, of citizen engagement. We can't just blame the politicians. It's actually about citizen engagement as well, about what they demand. Because the courage of the politicians is partly reflective of, of a public mood, of public demands. No different than when consumers demand better things of businesses. Right. Business can't do it without a consumer that also demands something. And, and so politicians are also responsive to the demands of their citizens. And so what I want to address is that question of the interplay, uh, inter, inter, uh, interplay between politics with a big P, politicians, the state, and the small P and the citizens engaged in that. And then our own work and journey related to that. I'm going to focus on two dimensions of creativity, sorry, of courage. Two dimensions of courage, which is an overriding theme of this year's summit. The courage to be creative and the courage to make integrity work. The courage to be, why does creativity require courage? Well, creativity requires courage because you might fail. It might not work. And, and politicians are, are not too happy to have egg on their face. So they go for safe decisions. Their senior civil servants also are likely to propose things to them that are safe. But the world is faced with extraordinary challenges, and playing it safe is not resolving some of these issues. Why does making integrity work require courage? Because again, it exposes you. It makes you vulnerable. Someone talked about being a tall poppy earlier. All right? You have to be able to vocalized to be allowed to speak about these things. It makes you vulnerable to, yes, you might not actually be using the ink properly, you might be doing other things improperly, so it makes you vulnerable as well. So I'm going to talk about these two elements of courage, the courage to be creative and the courage to make integrity work. Now I'll start with the one about creativity. And, and, and so I'm going to bring it down to a microcosm here, the NGO I head is called Integrity Action. We have our main office in London. But I decided a few, into our first year, we started in 2003, that through personal and other circumstances, why don't we set up an international office in Jerusalem? And, and it sounds like a crazy idea, right? This is a place in conflict. Why would you want to be based in Jerusalem? And where would you, why, where would you work? Where will your activities be? Well, actually, we said we will work regionally and internationally. And the then head of UNDP, an American called Tim Rothermel, who had worked in Palestine for many years, said this is fantastic. He was the only person at the time who believed in this and said, I'm going to help you to get started. 
Because the future of Jerusalem cannot simply be as the capital of two peoples. It's a city that belongs in the hearts of Christians, Muslims, and Jews. So it's a world city by definition, actually. And, and therefore, it has to have an international nature. Now, no UN agency can open up an office and work internationally. Of course, they all work locally. But they can't work internationally from Jerusalem as a city in conflict. But NGOs could do it. So how about having NGOs operating from there? Now, my idealistic side said, we're going to have Jews and Palestinians working together. They don't have a great track record of working together on solving their own problem. But how about they work together on solving other people's problems? Maybe that will give them a new perspective. And idealistically, I thought, this is a creative idea. Maybe it'll attract some funding. Maybe some enlightened donor will think, you know, this is interesting. It's worth doing. Tim Rothermel was the first and the only one who believed in that. Everyone else has said, this is completely crazy. It can't be done. But we've been doing it now for 10 years. And we work with governmental and non-governmental and private institutions right across the Arab world. When everyone said, it absolutely can't be done, they'll boycott you. We work with government institutions in Lebanon, universities from Kuwait to Saudi Arabia to Jordan and, and Iraq and Egypt and Algeria and Tunisia and the list goes on. And, and every couple of times I get a response from a donor who tells me, this can't be done. Well, that's a, we're doing it, right? And we have Jews and, Pal Jews and Palestinians, Israelis and Palestinians working together very well on addressing other people's problems. Now, and, and allow me here to be political, because so we, I've been spending these years working out of one of the most intractable conflicts, right? The location. I'm not addressing and working on the conflict, but we're working in that area where the global consensus is that there is a two-state solution, and that is the solution that will work for these people. Now, with the recent setbacks, some have criticized and have called that into question, as there have been people calling that into question for a while. Now, you'll allow me this parenthesis, I hope, because the session is political, so it's about politics, to, to bring this in. The two-state solution is absolutely dead. It can't work. It's it's something that didn't have really a viable past, and it certainly doesn't have a viable future. Because of a variety of reasons, but one of them is very simply, you have many Jews living in Palestine, and you of course have 20% of the Israeli population being Arab. But you also have the fact that once two states were to get formed, you have a disjointed Palestinian authority, which has a part in Gaza and a part in the West Bank, but what would then happen is that the internal differences would come very strongly to the fore in both societies, both in Israel and in Palestine. And those internal differences are enormous. They have to do with religion, they have to do with politics, they have to do with culture. They are very, very deep, much deeper than you hear about or are likely to see firsthand even if you go and visit. The one-state solution, however, is also dead. It's also not a viable solution. Why is that? Because it wouldn't really fulfill neither the aspirations of Jews nor of Palestinians. It would be two countries more or less with equitable sizes and population, but with Palestinians being far weaker than the Jewish, uh, Jewish Israeli side. It really wouldn't hold together. So neither two state nor one state work at all. And what you have now is politicians who don't have neither the creativity, certainly not the courage, but not just the courage to make peace, not the courage to be creative about these solutions. So if I tell you that neither one state nor two states, from working there, living there, and working with people on both sides, is at all viable, so what is? Then what's left? If, so this is where creativity comes into play. And actually the creativity for this isn't so far-fetched. It's actually right under our feet here in part. Right? The, the only viable, really, solution from someone, again, who's lived there for, for quite a long time, is a confederation of Israel and Palestine. A confederation that creates cantons, that has and recognizes the internal differences among people. Now, I won't go into any great depth on that. You know, Switzerland has functioned as a confederation for a very long time. This would be a very new idea in that context. What I found interesting is that in talking to people on both sides, very senior people on both sides, they say, this is actually what it's going to be. 
This is the likely future, but we can't talk about it now. Things aren't ready for that. And you wonder what courage does it really take when the current default position is utterly unviable. But enough of that. Let me move on now to the courage to make integrity work. What does that require? And what does that involve? And how can people be involved in it? And just actually the footnote to this, if politicians, even former politicians, don't have the courage to say something that they feel personally is a logical way to go, again, people, of course, have to be more vocal. They have to articulate it. They have to bring this out. Politicians are not going to be in the lead on this, necessarily. But now, let me come to the courage to make integrity work. As I said, it creates, it, it exposes one to certain vulnerability. Now, I'm going to define something. So, well, how do, what do I mean by integrity? A word that has been used by a number of people already over the course of the day. I define it as that set of characteristics in an organization, because I'm interested primarily in organizational integrity, that set of characteristics in an organization that increases both trust and trustworthiness among its key stakeholders. Trust is extremely important, but it has a subjective quality to it. An extreme example, Bernard Madoff, who ran the biggest Ponzi scheme the world has ever seen. If an indicator of trust is that people gave him all their money to manage, right, their entire foundation's endowment, much of their wealth, I think it's a pretty good indicator that they trusted him. Yeah, they wanted high returns, but they must have had some level of trust. Was the man trustworthy? Absolutely not, by a whole set of standards, right? So trust has a certain subjective quality to it. Very, very important, right? But there needs to be trustworthiness as well. So you need to balance both of those. So integrity is that set of characteristics that increases both trust and trustworthiness. Now, I'm going to give you three exam four examples, actually, and then my own, of integrity innovations. Now, by an integrity innovation in business, so a business integrity innovation is the following. A business integrity innovation is one that creates trust and, obviously, trustworthiness in a marketplace where none previously existed or where it was very low. Okay, that's how I'm defining a business integrity innovation. And the reason I'm going to share these experiences with you, or these case studies, is because I think it has real implications for politics, and that politicians don't have good answers today, especially in liberal democracies, of how to increase trust in politics. So there are four powerful examples over the last years of breakthrough business integrity innovations. One that you all know, but hasn't usually been described as such, is the Grameen Bank. Why is the Grameen Bank a business integrity innovation? Because here you had a situation where there is no reason for someone who has money to lend to trust right, that the borrower is going to pay it back, unless he uses the force of very heavy enforcement, and that costs you know, that costs muscle power, it's not particularly ethical, and so therefore the interest rates were very high. And so there was no trust in the borrowing relationship because there was no collateral. Mohammed Yunus created a way of basically institutionalizing that trust through the borrowing circles, and thereby making it possible to have trust in the lending relationship that the money would be repaid. So in a condition where there was no trust, he made it possible to create trust. Three more quick examples. eBay, right? the company that enables one to sell anything one wants online, second-hand, first-hand. But he basically made it possible to create a marketplace where you and I transact. We've never met each other. We're not meeting in a flea market, right? where I can see you, you can, I can give you the money, and I can see the goods. So in this case, we're never going to meet, we've never met. I'm giving you money and you're going to send me the goods. How do I know that either one of those things is going to happen? No trust. A priori, there's no reason why there should be trust in that transaction. But eBay made it possible to create trust in that context by rating both the vendor and the buyer and creating a system for the transfer of the money. Two more recent examples. Airbnb, which makes it possible to let your bedroom that you're not using, right, or your apartment or your house, 
even castles and small villas are on the market there. Why is that a place where trust had to be created? Well, if I'm going to invite someone right, to sleep in my next door bedroom, and that person is trusting that when I'm going to sleep there, I'm also going to be safe. Right? There's no reason up here. This is not a bed and breakfast. It's not a registered hotel. How can I trust that I'm going to be safe? And how can the person letting that room know that they're going to be safe? Again, Airbnb created the marketplace, now valued at $10 billion, right? making trust possible in a marketplace where none existed before. A real business integrity innovation. Fourth and last example from that series is Uber. You might have heard of it. It's you know, latest hot ticket, which enables one to use one's own personal car to become a taxi service. Again, right? It's not just about the ease of being able to call on a taxi. It is the trust that the driver has that whoever steps into that car is a trustworthy person. And if something bad should happen, I have a way of you know, at least reporting it, but also, of course, the other way around, that I know that I'm stepping into a car of someone who has been vetted in some form. By creating trust in that marketplace, they've opened up incredible opportunities. Yes, regulators and, of course, established taxi drivers aren't happy about it. That's fair enough, as uh, hotels in New York are furious, and landlords as well, but that's a separate issue, right? That's a regulatory issue, and fair enough on them. These are very disruptive businesses in that sense, as black market moneylenders weren't particularly happy with Mohammed Yunus. So I'm suggesting to you that actually what's happening in some areas of business is the ethics is actually very important in all of these, right? But these are disruptive businesses that have put the making of trust, creating trust in a marketplace where none previously existed or which was very low, has opened up extraordinary opportunities. Now, I'll share with you our own work in integrity action. So trust in developing countries where we work, trust in the state is not particularly high. You said 87% of French citizens don't have trust in their politicians. Well, trust in many developing countries is, is no better. And according to the trust barometer of Edelman, which they've been doing now for over a dozen years, indeed, trust in government is even worse than in business, right? So business leaders are slightly better off than government officials. And in fact, NGOs are no longer as trusted as they used to be either. So what, what does this imply for, for the kind of work that we are doing? If the first 10 years of my career as in, you know, working in an international NGO were about anti-corruption, the last 11 years have been about building integrity. And how do we do it? So the two main lines of our work are one is working at the community level and the second is working in education, trying to bring this into the education system. And so I want to share with you briefly what the approaches that we take in both of these areas. In, as far as working at the community level, when I was here last year, we, had, we were able to show that we had brought better public services to just under 2 million people over the last five years. In the last 12 months, we've added two more 2 million people to that. So our methodology and the scale at which we're operating has increased quite significantly the pace at which we're able to do this. And, and so there's a five-step process that this goes through. The first is identifying people's needs, their priorities, at the local, at the community level, and also who the spoilers are. Who is it who has a stake in the status quo? Who is likely to undermine this? That's the first step. Because we're working, we've trained through these efforts just in the last year, 2,000 community volunteers who are doing this work. 2,000 people creating basically better services for 2 million. They're doing it on a voluntary basis. The only reason they agree to volunteer, these are poor members of their communities, very often they're illiterate. They only do it because this actually matters to them. The second stage is one of joint learning. These things have to be learned. People are frustrated, desperately frustrated with services, governments that don't work, politicians they can't trust, people are stealing money. But they actually have to learn the skills of how to address these issues. And so we're introducing a whole set of tools, principles, values, different ways of thinking about public service, about integrity in government than they have been able, willing to consider before. The third is the evidence base. 
to have very strong evidence of what's not going right. To, the problem has to define, be defined as objectively as possible. It's defined, for example, as a discrepancy between a contract and its actual implementation, between an entitlement to a dispensary, to medication, and actual access. Right? So it has to be, they have to show that they have access to the budgets, to the contracts, and the rest of it. And that's not easy to do in many contexts. Having gathered that and having, through this joint learning, identified allies on the inside, because this is done collaboratively, you have to have people in government you can work with. They might be at a low level. You don't necessarily need the mayor's approval to do this, but you have to find people on the inside you can work with. The fourth step is to come up with solutions to this. And so what happens to these first, second, third stages is by the time of the third stage, there will be evidence in many, many places of not only maladministration, but of outright fraud and corruption. Again, the problems we're dealing with in many places are very crude. It is water points, the pump has been stolen. It is a school was contracted for five classrooms, only three classrooms were built. It's a road that was contracted for eight meters width, it was only built five meters wide. So you're getting a lot of money being stolen from this. And so it's how to bring it back to where it was supposed to be, how to get what was originally supposed to be there. And the fifth stage is closing the loop. And closing the loop is, of course, implementing that recommendation. But if it doesn't work, if it's not possible to implement it, then at the very least, revisiting the principles and getting around to it again. On average, we succeed with this more than half the time, 55% to be exact. And that may seem larger or l small, it's a great deal larger than most other forms of compliance, oversight, auditor general, anti-corruption, different types of monitoring are achieving. And why is that? Because it's values-based, right? And it's very solution-focused. We call it basically being proactive integrity. And it's building trust. So again, I would say, like some of these private sector examples, it's a disruptive integrity-based solution not based on compliance, based on solutions. I'll end with the example from education, what we're doing in the education field. There we're, by now, actually since that bio was, was uploaded, it's now close to 500 universities we work with. It's several hundred schools, the schools keep growing up. And it's a few dozen civil service training institutions that we work with around the world, in 60 countries, as you said. And the curricula that we try to facilitate the introduction of, because they, the curricula have to be developed locally, but the curricula reflect three ways to learn about this issue. The first level is at the moral and ethical level. Why does this matter? Why is this important? The second is normative. What are the basic ideas? What are the concepts? What are the laws? What are the institutions? The third level is case studies, and ideally case studies of both their own context and of others, of successes and failures. As you said, failures are very important as well. The fourth level is critical. Is, okay, and, and of course that depends on the age slightly, but you know, you've told us that integrity is good, but then please explain to us why some of the most corrupt countries on the world, in the world actually are very successful economies. The biggest economy in the world today, China by PPP, right, is extremely corrupt. So why is it so successful? Right. Many corrupt politicians have made it into office. Many corrupt businesses have actually succeeded year after year, decade after decade. The fifth level is problem-centered, bringing live problems to the classroom. And the sixth level is action learning, putting it into practice. Now, this took us quite a while again to experiment, innovate, to be able to introduce these six types of learning into both schools, universities, and civil service training institutions. In most universities, they stop at the first or, sec or sorry, second or third level. It doesn't go very deep. And so if youth, 
students, others, are going to really experience this and become citizens that demand something different of their politicians, I would suggest thinking about it in these ways. I'll just end with the following, which is, we, it wasn't our intention, but what has happened through this work is we now have a several dozen cases of people who've gone into politics as a result of this work, whether it's in local government, regional government, and even in national government. And this is extremely exciting because it's coming out of both conviction but also personal experience. And seeing that politics is another route to making these things a reality. Thank you very much.